But I want you to bring your attention to this now because um, I'm trying to introduce how uh, we stumbled upon a set of laws of physics that we call, uh, that we call quantum mechanics. And uh, quantum mechanics has a bit of a traumatic childhood <laughs> beginning that uh, quite different from special relativity. With special relativity, you know, I gave you some experimental basis of special relativity, Michelson moral experiment, but uh, I hope everyone remembers me saying this. I told you that like it, that experiment didn't affect Einstein at all. Einstein was a theorist. He came up with a special relativity kind of theoretically. This was the set of rules that made sense in the world where Maxwell's equations were correct. Quantum mechanics is completely the other way. Quantum mechanics is uh, the, it finds its origins in, um, uh, in experiments, in specifically experiments that contradicted theoretical predictions. So what you just saw, black body radiation, that's uh, one of such experiments that, I guess you could put it this way, that defied theoretical explanation in an attempt to come up with a theory to, um, to describe what people saw quite plainly what they could see experimentally. That's where people discovered quantum mechanics, really piece by piece. And what I'm hoping to introduce today that we kind of need for Thursday's lab is um, the quantum mechanical nature of light. So let me put this on the proper um, place where, uh, so you saw the black body spectrum, right? You have some sense that the black body spectrum, it's a range of colors. Let me actually show you a black body spectrum. Actually, uh, let me do it this way. Rather than, your textbook has one, but uh, FET simulation actually has one that's better, where I can actually change the parameters. So how hot do you think that sphere was? So, take a guess, 1,000 degrees C? Sounds reasonable. Uh, do you, people with the physics 4B here, do you remember your physics 4B red hot calorimetry result? <laughs> okay, is it at least between 1,000 and 2,000 degrees C? All right, so no more than 2,000 degrees C. All right, so let me use this. This is a simulation that just show you uh, what black body spectrum looks like based on the temperature. So if it's you know 1,000 degrees C, then let's say the temperature might be something around, I don't know, 2,000 Kelvin. So it's actually quite a bit high. Oops, I need to zoom in. All right, so it, this is what this says the spectrum was. Does that look like the spectrum that you remember seeing? So what you remember seeing is reddish color, right? So, um, so this is what I was saying that what you are seeing is not the, exactly the spectrum. What you are seeing is a kind of a product or convolution of your eye's response function, what your eye can see, and what that emits as light. What that emits as light is, is actually mostly in infrared. In fact, even if you were to get this as, you know, so this is a, a little bit higher than oven temperature, which also glows. Um, even if you got it as hot as light bulb, even if you got it as hot as light bulb, actually um, the maximum of intensity will still be outside of visible range. That's why light bulbs are so inefficient and LED lights are so much more efficient. Um, but what you do see here is this feature. So, I mean, you did see red and green color. And if you zoom in enough to the spectrum, you can see, yeah, I, I saw red here and I saw green here. And I looked for blue, but I couldn't quite see blue because there was very little blue there. So that's the spectrum you saw. So that's the black body spectrum. And um, you know, people could make this measurement. And I mean, I guess they probably had a difficulty measuring infrared. But what they did know was when you have a hot object that's glowing, as the object gets hotter, you know, as the hottest light bulb, it, um, the spectrum shifts to um, shorter and shorter wavelength. In fact, I don't know if. Uh, Fins displacement law, yeah, we definitely don't cover that in 4B. So there's a law that describes something called the Fins displacement law that says the product of the wavelength and the temperature is somehow constant. <laughs> um, 
So people have been studying this black body radiation for quite some time. And this kind of spectrum was, experimentally speaking, well known. That um, you had that, um, so you have a spectrum that, uh, th that is a local maximum. So if you go to a very long wavelength, and then you know, the intensity there is a very, gets a smaller and smaller. But also, when you go to shorter wavelength, the intensity also gets a smaller eventually. And there were theorists that were trying to explain this, because um, this is the picture you have to, uh, towards the end of the 20, uh, 19th century. You have a complete description of electricity and magnetism in the, in the form of Maxwell's equations. People understand now that light is electromagnetic radiation. And um, you have development of uh, thermodynamics uh, based on the like, kinetic theory of uh, molecules. So, and you have atomic theory that's developing. So people understand that when you look at an object like this, it's made up of charged particles, electrons, and that when it gets hot, that there are electrons oscillating around. That has a lot of kinetic energy. So they understand, they can get a kind, so this is the kind of thing that we couldn't, they couldn't have imagined describing in Newton's time. Because you know, in Newton's time, they look at this ball, they have no idea what it's made of. By the end of 20th, sorry, 19th century, they, it's within their grasp. They can say, oh, it's made of, of charged particles. As they get hotter, they oscillate. As they oscillate, they emit electromagnetic radiation. So they feel like they, have, they can actually develop a theory to describe this theoretically, not just experimentally. And that's where they ran into problem. Now, I want to see if, uh, does this let me show Ray Legion's uh, prediction? I don't think it lets me show Ray Legion's prediction. So I guess I'll just have to draw it. Uh, let me just draw it. So, um, so I'm not going to do the actual derivation, mainly because I can't. <laughs> but I'm also not going to do it because it's uh, another description of a theory that turned out to be wrong. So, um, well, I mean, it's a theory you know now, but, so this is a prediction of something called Rayleigh genes. Um, how many here are familiar with the name Lord Rayleigh outside of Rayleigh criterion? It's the same Rayleigh. How many here know, have you heard of the phenomenon called Rayleigh scattering? No? You guys never asked the question, why is the sky blue? Yeah, the way it's explained is through Rayleigh scattering. As the light comes, the light oscillates the electrons, and that oscillating electron is like an oscillating dipole. The, it has a frequency dependence. It happens uh, better at uh, shorter wavelengths, so the scattered light is, has more blue color in it than red. That's why the scattered light looks blue. And near the sunset, the, when you look at the light that has come through the atmosphere, the light that hasn't scattered looks redder, right? This, like you cover this sometimes in like middle school high science classes, right? In these qualitative terms. And in upper division physics, you might actually do the derivation, but I won't. Uh, it's the same really. So he's uh, known for doing that kind of uh, derivations. So um, he and, I don't know who Jens is. So it's called the Rayleigh Jens Law. It describes a prediction of electromagnetic radiation from a hot object, a black body radiation. And here's a part of the prediction they do get correct. They do get correct that as you go to longer wavelengths, the intensity of the radiation would die off, that it would go down. And you can understand this. Um, do you guys remember seeing that oscillating dipole simulation I showed and how the amplitude of uh, wave changes depending on the frequency? Did I show you that? Maybe not. Okay, okay. Let me quickly do that just so that you have some intuitive feel for it. So, you know, to do it properly, it would take a lot of math, but I can just show you a quick simulation so that at least you have some sense that it's intuitively correct without going through a bunch of complicated math. Uh, ready? No, I don't know. Maybe. Ah, uh, radiating charge, this is the one. So, 
I can set this charge to go in a circle. That's the one I like the best. Let me make the amplitude kind of small. And so this is sort of the magnitude of the radiated wave. And if I want this to be larger, um, more intensity, then I could make the, um, the amplitude of the, the oscillation itself larger. Or the other thing I can do is I can increase the frequency. So the electromagnetic radiation is a result of accelerating electric charges. So when it's oscillating more quickly, it has greater acceleration, so it emits more radiation. But intuitively, that makes qualitative sense. That you know, if I have a charge that's oscillating a lot more quickly than another charge, then it would be emitting a way more electromagnetic energy. Yes. Yeah. As long as it makes somewhat intuitive sense, like you know, saying you know, two is greater than one, then <laughs> let me just move on from there and not try to prove how two is greater than one. So. So Rayleigh Jean's law. So Rayleigh Jean's law predicts that portion okay. It says longer wavelength. That means a short, uh, uh, smaller frequency. It says that longer wavelength, yes, less uh, intensity of um, light emitted. But where Rayleigh Jean's law fails is. When you, so when you run the calculation for shorter and shorter wavelength, this is what Rayleigh Jean's law predicts. You can find this figure in the textbook. Just keeps on going up without limit. There is uh, nothing, there's no known physical effect that Rayleigh and Jean's could consider that would force this intensity to come down at the high frequency range or shorter wavelength range. This uh, acquired a term that actually people use even today in different contexts. This is called ultraviolet catastrophe. I mean, you know, catastrophe makes it sound like um, it's a terrible thing. Well, it's a terrible thing for theorists. It's a terrible thing for the theory. Because what theorists would predict is that if you, you know, you see the oven here, right? If you open up an oven, what the theory predicts is that you will be blinded by burst of gamma rays from the oven, or x-rays, or ultraviolet rays, whatever. Now, it doesn't actually happen, so it's not real catastrophe. It's the catastrophe for the theorists who were predicting something that doesn't happen. But uh, so that, that was quite a puzzle. And a lot of people have worked on it. And um, it really came down to there is no known law of physics that would uh, lead to this limiting behavior. So um, the solution to that the solution to this problem, solution to this ultraviolet catastrophe, is proposed by a, a German physicist named Max Planck. I guess uh, he must have been fairly there in Germany. There is a bunch of institutions called Max Planck Institute. How many here from Germany? Never mind. Uh, I, so anyway, so uh, Max Planck is the a guy who suggested a solution to this ultraviolet catastrophe. And I want to just uh, present his solution and sort of um, redrive some of these things that, um, that, um, that I think we can do from that solution. So let me put it this way. Um, so black body radiation, I'm just going to write down ultraviolet catastrophe which results from Rayleigh Jean's law. I'm writing down all these terms because I'm kind of going through fast and I'm not really doing you know, thorough coverage of this. If you're interested, you can Google search and read, or you can read the textbook. <laughs> um, so let me s start out with uh, Max Planck's solution to this ultraviolet catastrophe. 